author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and today I'm at the 2018 Pacific Northwest Writers Conference with author Kat Rambo. <laughs> Kat, welcome to Author. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here. Can you remember in your whole, not overly long life, but it's a full life, when story, when you looked up and realized story was interesting to you, like you cared about it? Boy, that's a hard question because I'm not sure I remember that early. Right, so it was um, just almost well, as soon as you could talk kind of thing. My grandmother was a writer. Uh, she wrote young adult sports fiction. And because I was a reader and loved to read, it was always sort of assumed that I, will be, that I would be a writer. And she did a lot to nurture that. She bought me tons and tons of books whenever I was interested in anything. And so I don't think there ever was a question there ever was a moment where I was like, this is story, because story had always been there just as part, part of, of my your life. Fat. That's so interesting, yeah. yeah. I do think there is a thing where you have to say, even, if you, even though you come from a family of people who are intellectuals and writers and such, where you have to say, I, I don't just want to be a reader. Like, I want to see if I can yeah. do this professionally. And it's never a guarantee. Do you remember when you kind of made I, that? I can tell you exactly okay. when. Yeah. Um, I was working for Microsoft and had been working there for, I think, about eight years. And I got to a point where I had always assumed I would be a writer. And I said, boy, if I'm going to be a writer, I sort of need to get started. Yeah. So I talked to my spouse and said, I really want to do this. Are you willing to pay the mortgage for a while? Yeah. And he was very supportive. And that was in 2005. I went off to the Clarion West Writers Workshop and they kept warning us that so many people got overwhelmed by the workshop and stopped writing that it terrified me. So after the workshop, I kept trying to get a story a week done for the Short next story. three months, yeah. And that began, you began to find your voice. I began to find my voice, yeah. And when in that journey did you think Maybe you never think this, like, I think I can do, like, I get this, like, I get what my voice is, I get what I'm doing, or was it never? I, boy, I, I have people say to me sometimes, I can tell that's a Cat Rambo story, and I can never tell You couldn't myself. tell them what a Cat Rambo story I, I, is. I don't know. It's a love of language, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, science fiction is interesting. I, t I interviewed William Gibson, and he was talking about the genres. Yeah, he really yeah. struggles with it because his challenge, and maybe you can speak to this, but he talked about the, one of the challenges of genre is that he feels the audience has an expectation of the same thrill again and again. That he feels himself struggling against that a little bit. Does that make sense to you or do well, you feel? I can see where definitely when you come to a William Gibson book, you want a William Gibson experience. Right. Um, I don't know if that's always true. I think Certainly there are, there are some books where you can kind of go to them over and over again and know that you'll get the same thing from them. But one of the things that I love about speculative fiction is how varied and different and many splendored it is. Well, that was, gonna be, that was my question. Is you didn't, he feel, I think he felt cramped by it yeah. for whatever reason. Because he, he didn't see himself as a science fiction writer, yeah. he said, until they gave him all the awards. <laughs> right? yeah. He said, well, I guess I'm going to say But so you don't feel, you feel you can have full expression of what you're interested in exploring through the metaphor of science fiction. I can't because I mean for one thing I have control over how much fantasy there is in the story. It can be very subtle or right. it can you know there can be unicorns around every corner. Right. Um, I tend towards the subtle stuff. More. You do. Why? Why do you like the subtle? I like the subtle because I think it leaves more for the reader's imagination. Oh. You don't want to you don't want to fill in every detail. No. No, I, and you can't, right? Uh, what appears in the reader's head is never going to match what's in yes. your head. Now, see, that, I, you know, that is interesting of all, of all genres, of course. Uh, and it's why there's great debates when things are made into movies. And, but it, it didn't occur until this moment that that's perhaps more true of science fiction and fantasy, where they're trying to build a world that isn't our own. Yes. And based that's, on it. That's the art, is to kind of feed in the details in a way that never contradicts what the reader's building in their head. 
because as soon as you contradict what they're, and they're suddenly like, no, the eyes are green and I have them pictured as blue, right. they're bounced out of the story and they remember their reading. And that's the cardinal sin. That's right. You don't, you just want them living it. That's don't it. You? That's it. I remember, who's it? China Mievel. You know, oh, China, I love China. So we were talking about world building once, and I thought one of the interesting challenges of world, particularly in Dungeons and Dragons, when I was writing those adventures, is to have it feel like the world exists outside of the tunnel of yeah. the story. Yeah. Right? You know, that's the great thing about Tolkien, is it feels like this thing was just like alive yes. from the, the weeds up. So, how do you deal? He had his sort of strategies for that. Because it seems you don't want it to feel like it's just this. Right. So how do you ad address that? I try to think about the economics of things. I try oh. to think about what's scarce and what's plentiful. Because if you have a world where magic has no cost, it just it makes no economic sense whatsoever. Right. You'd just um, be doing it. Doing you'd just it. be doing it. I just, I think about... I just did a class with Fran Wild. Uh, she taught from my school, and it was amazing. But she talked about a meal, and then built the world out from that by talking about where did the food come from, and what are the rituals surrounding it? Where did the spices come from? Who's preparing it? Who's eating it? And it was like, yeah, just that little scrap can hold a whole You've world. You've got to be it. so interested in that stuff. Oh, I love that those stuff. questions. You have to oh, be so yeah. interested in answering them. That was part of why I couldn't write it because I actually wasn't that interested in answering those questions, you know, but you have to be. You like, do have to be. And it can be it can be really interesting and stories can grow out of little details from one story. How often when you're sitting there writing and you go, "Okay, I've built this world pretty well, but I do need to flesh I realize in this chapter I need to flesh it out." You throw some detail in in chapter four, and then you get to chapter 20, you go, oh, that was the perfect detail. Yeah. Does that happen? Yeah, that happens. And that's, my feeling is my unconscious mind is much smarter than I am. Amen. Yes. Yeah. And so I sometimes tell my students, one of the jobs of a professional writer is to know what you don't have to know. That, that is exactly right. right that I you think. don't need to know as much as you think you got to know. Yeah. And, and you found that to be the case. Stephen King talks about going back in rewriting and looking for the details that you can use as though it were an archaeological dig. And so you find the detail that creates something like that and you sort of So the detail that just sort of dirt. comes up to you yeah. and you say, ah, that's I'm what I'm going to use that. Now I'm going to use the yeah. thing that just seemed to come randomly. Yeah. yeah. It's really true though, isn't it, Kat, that we have to, and I don't write fiction anymore, I write nonfiction, but it's the same thing happens where the little sentence that I didn't plan informs what the piece is about. Yeah. Yeah. That how much we have to rely on that. Yeah. What we what we don't plan, and even someone who's building worlds. And I think I think it's important to keep that in mind because one of the things th that you may have found as well paralyzes students is when they feel like they have to make it make sense when they write it. Right. <laughs> Before they write or while they <laughs> write. As it, they they're like they it's a page and I must fill it with genius and yeah. then they can't. So but you got you just gotta write it. It's hard it to teach sense. that, though, isn't it? Because it's perfectly normal to think it should make sense. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, Jay Lake used to say, you've got to give yourself permission to write crap. And I think that's very true. So that's a, you know, that's a fame. I've heard the, the Hemingway had a quote about that, too. Yeah. And so that's, it's very true. But that's a hard, it's one thing to say it. Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to do it. That's why. You know? The, w the way that I kind of get around it is I have two two things, and one is that I promise I will do 2,000 words a day, and that is my Stephen King rule, because right. that's what he does, and he's a good person to emulate. And the other is I do a lot of timed writings, where I'm just like, Alexa, set a timer for 20 minutes, and I just go. And when you say go, do I you, go. you go like, nope, nope. I keep yeah. my fingers moving, yeah. and I try not to think as I'm writing. I try to just let it come out. I think that, so I have a book called Fearless Writing just came out where I talk about using that method because it's a good way to get, to practice getting out of your head. What it feels like when it's just ripping. You don't worry yes. about what it sounds like if it's any good. That's it. But the feeling of just letting it come. Yeah. And that's, that's when your unconscious mind is throwing that's up right. that good stuff. Because you can feel like, because you can, if you get on a roll, you can be doing your real writing, yeah. and it can feel like the free writing that you're yeah. describing. And that's such a glorious feeling. That's Isn't just, it? Oh, so no, good. No, but you know, we're, we're kind of laughing about it, but I really believe like it doesn't get any better than that. No, it, in it, my doesn't. Life. it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It can be as good somewhere, but that's as good as it gets. Life. When the words are flowing, it is, it is just an amazing feeling. And it, it, is. it is. We spend our time chasing that feeling. That's right. All right, Kat, I got one more question for okay. you. I want you to finish this sentence. Uh-oh. If writing has taught you anything, it's taught you what? 
it's taught me to love other human beings because they are all fascinating.